Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Returning to the studio. You know him. He's the co-host. Wait for it. Wait for it. His name is Padawan J. Well, let me talk to you. Yeah. Uh, there's at least half of this panel does not have SEC bias. We'll leave you to figure out which half that is. Yes, we will definitely be discussing that and a whole lot more in the land of sports, so we definitely want to get that conversation rolling. But before we go there, Pat, where does everybody go after the show? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over to the website. There's a lot happening there. The social media accounts are all right there on the front page. Follow, subscribe, interact. We definitely like to keep those conversations rolling through the week. Also, check out the T Public store. It's Christmas time. What can we say? Mm-hmm. There's sales happening left and right, so you never know when it's going to pop up. So if you want to get some ODPH swag, now is the perfect time to do it. So make sure to click on the link, see when the sale is going on, and go get yourself some ODPH gear. I can't stress it enough. It's the best time of the year. Also, check out the Patreon link, one tier, $2 a month, and bonus content. Do-do-do. Also, shout out to our amazing patrons as well. The blog section, where we always got reviews drop in the classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3FM Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, a lot of things happening there I can't discuss right now, uh, and many, many more. The directory, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 126,000. That's why he's the statistician to the stars, folks. I can't keep track of it. He's got that locked down. Also, check out the music section. If you want to go get uh, some music as a gift for this holiday season, well, you come to the right place because obviously Brian Wolf and the Howlers have some stuff going on there. Tom Jolu, shout out the robots. Brand new Floodlands is out. Yeah. Uh, you know, so many more that contribute to the ODPH. It's always amazing to see, so you definitely want to make sure to go check that out. And for anything else that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off the sports edition, as we always do during the National Football League season, we have to recap the week that was with our locks and leaps. So, Pat, kick us off. Yeah, so we're going to start with my locks. I chose the Kansas City Chiefs to defeat the Green Bay Packers because I figured, hey, Green Bay, not that. Awful, but not that good. Kansas City, usually pretty good. Uh, I was wrong, though, because Green Bay ended up winning by the final score of 27-19. to Jordan Love. 25-36, 267 yards passing, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Patrick Mahomes, 21-33, 210 yards passing, one touchdown, one interception. Isaiah Pacheo uh, led Kansas City in rushing with 18 carries, 110 yards, one touchdown. A.J. Dillon led the way in Green Bay, 18 carries, 73 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Romeo Dobbs led Green Bay in receiving with four catches, 72 yards, no touchdowns. And Travis Kelsey led the way for Kansas City with four catches, 81 yards, and no touchdowns. Surprising performance by the Packers. Mm -hmm. We have to give them their due. Jordan Love proving some doubters wrong. Yeah. He is emerging as a very quality NFL quarterback. Yeah. I know that maybe luck striking a third time in a row in Green Bay. I, you know, we have to give him their due. The front office there took a big risk taking him in the first round, thus causing a huge rift with Whoa. Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, and now it looks like maybe they were right in the decision they made. It's a crazy scenario to play out, but yeah. Love looked great in prime time. Kansas City, I don't know if they looked past him too much. They looked out of sync Mm -hmm. very uncharacteristically for the Chiefs. And only six points in the entire first half. Yeah, they did not get the ball rolling. The Packers were putting pressure on them left and right. Mahomes was struggling. And they really could not get any movement on their offensive side of the ball, which is very, very shocking because, let's face it, Green Bay is not known for their defense. Hasn't been for quite some time. So to see the performance put on by the Packers, that's huge especially for a team that we all wrote off for dead, but 
are making some runs through the playoffs here, Pat. Yeah, I mean, it's it's entirely possible because looking at the uh, NFL standings here currently in the NFC Conference, Green Bay Packers sitting there in third place, or tied for second place, I should say. Uh, they're tied with the Minnesota Vikings, who are both 6-6. Six and six. Obviously, the Detroit Lions running away with the, the, uh, the division with a record of 9-3. and three. Flip it over to the playoff side of the standings, and currently you have, where the heck are they? Wow, this is a weird setup. Uh, come back to me on this one. The standings are looking real weird at the moment. Well, you know, there's a lot of flux going on, if yeah. I can use that word. Yeah. And obviously, with the wins and losses that happened over this weekend, a lot of the playoff races that were just clear cut are not so much anymore. And especially for where Green Bay is standing, this is a situation that they almost control their own destiny, which is wild to think about. Mm hmm. Because for a few weeks, we all thought, well, it was over. Obviously, Detroit is in the driver's seat of the NFC North. Right. Minnesota, we don't know what we're getting out of them each week. There we go. Uh, Currently, the Green Bay Packers have the number seven seed Mm -hmm. in the uh, NFC. So the Packers have found a way to get in. Mm -hmm. It's now going to be a matter of can they maintain that. Yeah. And that's going to be the true test for them because I don't know if they can, to be honest with you. I'm not saying it was the star power showing up, but. Clearly, this game had star power. You know who was there for the Kansas City side. The person of the year. Uh, Yes, the time person of the year. Taylor Swift was at the game. But also you had former WWE Women's Champion Liv Morgan was at the game. Mm -hmm. And also the most decorated female gymnast in Olympic Olympic history, the GOAT, Simone Biles, was there supporting her husband. Yes. The star power was almost too much to handle. And uh, I'd say it skewed on the favor of uh, Green Bay side. Well, I think when you're put in that primetime position, and let's face it, every single analyst on the pre-show ruled against Green Bay. They said Kansas City was going to win. Right. We all took Kansas City because Kansas, Kansas City has been playing lights-out football, whether you love them or hate them. Mm-hmm. They've, they've been playing very well. Green Bay took offense, and they showed up, and this is a huge momentum swing for them. Yeah. Because if they can slow down the Kansas City offense, they can shut down Detroit. Mm-hmm. They could hang with San Francisco. I'm not going to say shut down them. Mm-hmm. Possibly shut down Philly. Yeah. So this is a huge momentum swing. And Green Bay, very favorable schedule to close out the year. All right, let's talk about it. Uh, Yeah, so their next game is this coming Monday uh, against the New York Giants. That'll be on uh, Monday Night Football on ABC and ESPN. Uh, Week 15 at home against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Week 16 on the road playing the Carolina Panthers. Week 17 on the road playing the Minnesota Vikings. And then they close out the regular season uh, Sunday, January 7th at home against the Chicago Bears. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that is very favorable in there. They should beat the Giants. They should beat yeah. Carolina. And those last two toss up, although you would think they beat Minnesota given their, you know, struggles on the offensive side of the ball for Minnesota. And Chicago should beat Chicago as well. But again, division, never know. That, the only one that might give them a little hiccup is Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is very up and down, hit or miss. Well, I think that's going to be the true test for love. And what he can get out of this team moving forward because, like I say, they they control their own destiny. Mm -hmm. They're not like Kansas City, who everybody wrote was going to win here, and they got punched in the mouth, and now you know the sky is falling, so to speak. Yeah, This is a situation that they're playing with house money. Mm -hmm. So as long as they stay the course, they should be fine to get in. And then once you're in, you every game matters so much more. Yeah. So they can go a lot of different directions. And then for the Kansas City Chiefs, this upcoming Sunday, they are at home against the Buffalo Bills. Uh, something tells me a few people will be watching that game. Oh, yes. A uh, week after that, it was supposed to be on Monday Night Football, but it is the first ever game flexed out of the Monday Night Football slot. That would be... Uh, uh, on the road in New England playing the Patriots, which to that I say, thank God. Yeah. Uh, week 16 at home against the Las Vegas Raiders. Week 17 at home against the Cincinnati Bengals. And then they close out the regular season on the road playing the Chargers. Not the easiest road for the Chiefs. No. Uh, the Bills game is going to be very interesting. Um, both teams something to prove. Both teams something to prove. I, I know after this week's games, Buffalo was technically back in the race. For the playoffs. We back, baby. Never left. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on by Bill's Mafia. So pump the brakes, folks. <laughs> we have to win out to really maintain. Mm-hmm. But for Kansas City, this is a bad loss. Mm-hmm. And this is one that it's on them. It's not on anybody else. They played very poorly. Yeah. 
and they got punched in the mouth and didn't know how to react. It's not coming out of that last minute pass interference nonsense. Oh, either. it was. Uh, please stop with that nonsense. Yeah, the uh, the amount of apologies going to Kansas City is ridiculous. Right. Like, like let's face it, folks, you have a very good team. Mm-hmm. Sometimes good teams lose mm-hmm. when a better team shows up. Yeah, that's what happened here because you just have to look at the first half. It doesn't come down to some meaningless play at the end. You guys have been getting calls the entire year your favor. It's like we say with boxing. It's like we say with uh, UFC and MMA. Don't leave it in the judges' hands. Mm-hmm. Or in this case, don't leave it so that it's one call in your eyes. You And I say you as in you, the fan. Yeah. That you, oh, that, that's the call that screwed that. No, like the fact you only put up six points in the entire first half mm-hmm. definitely contributed. That's the problem. Your offense didn't work. Your offense had no answer for for Green Bay's defense. Mm-hmm. How wild of a statement is that? I mean, unless you're playing Madden on easy, it's not one you usually hear. Yeah. So regroup. Let's see what happens this week. Yeah. Buffalo, a lot of people are talking upset. It could happen. Yeah, Am I going to say it? Anything's possible, any, you know, any given Sunday. No, but I think the only thing is I would do is take the over if you can afford to do it. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And I will leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of bad losses and not ideal this time of year, uh, I chose the Cincinnati Bengals to beat the Jacksonville Jaguars, which they did. Uh, So it's a bad loss for uh, Jacksonville when they can ill afford it, Mm -hmm. uh, especially for playoff seating Uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals beating the Jacksonville Jaguars 34 to 31. Jake Browning, 32 of 37, 354 passing yards, Ooh. one touchdown, no interceptions. Trevor Lawrence, 22 of 29, uh, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, and then you had Travis Etain Jr. lead Jacksonville in rushing, which of course he did. Mm-hmm. Uh, 11 carries, 45 yards, one touchdown. Joe Mixon led the way for Cincinnati with 19 carries, 68 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, always open, 7-11, whatever you want to call him. Jamar Chase led Cincinnati in receiving because, duh, 11 catches, 149 yards, one touchdown. Evan Ingram, yes, the giant New York Giants legend, greatest receiver of all time in their history. Mm-hmm. Evan Ingram led the way in Jacksonville. Nine catches, 82 yards, one touchdown. Should also note a couple of injury concerns for those Jacksonville Jaguars because, like I said, this lo- this loss, n- n- not ideal this time of year. The other thing you got to wonder about is uh, when Trevor Lawrence went down late in the game. Uh, with what appeared to be some sort of foot injury. I know it was speculated that it was possible Achilles. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, it's not. Uh, it has been diagnosed as a high ankle sprain. And as of two hours ago, of the, as of this recording, uh, reading from ESPN.com, it says, quote, Lawrence, ankle, won't practice Wednesday. Michael Duraco of ESPN.com reports, and his status is listed as questionable. And the other update we have for you is Ken's favorite wide receiver in the National Football League. I was going to say. Christian Kirk. Uh, Christian Kirk is listed as out because as of one day ago, quote, Coach Doug Peterson said Tuesday that Kirk will miss some time due to the core muscle injury that he suffered during Monday's 34-31 to overtime defeat to the Bengals. Mark Long of the Associated Press reports. And also one catch, 26 yards, I believe. Yes. Tough break for Jacksonville this week. Mm-hmm. And this is now going to put them in a very interesting situation. Because they're currently first in the AFC South, 8-4 and four record. Indianapolis, though, hot on their heels. Four-game yep. four winning streak going on right now. Spoiler alert. 7-5. Mm-hmm. and five. Yeah. They're, they're nipping right at their heels. Plus Houston, 7-5, and five too. Oh, right? God, yeah, that's right. So Trevor Lawrence's injury could not have come at a worse time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. This is a very, very bad loss for Jacksonville. Yeah, uh-huh. Which we have to remember, Cincinnati without Joe Burrow, their expectation level is very, very low right now. Yes. Jake Browning played an amazing game. Game of his life. I will give him all the credit in the world for it. He looked very, very good, all things considered, against Uh Jacksonville. I don't think we can pencil them in for the playoffs. Uh, No, uh, that's probably a safe bet because they are currently, where is the NFC or AFC North? There it is. Last place in the AFC North with a record of 6-6. And And if you flip over to the playoff standings, they are currently, where the hell? There's a few teams there at 6-6. They're uh, they're 11. So they're they're tied with the Buffalo Bills, who are also 6-6 at the 10th position. The uh, Denver Broncos were ninth at this uh, ninth uh, with six and six record, and then you've got the Texans at the eight position with a seven and five record. See, this is where things are going to get very, very tricky. It could get bad for the fucking Jaguars because Jaguars are in fourth right now mm. because they're a division leader. But if they go on a slide here, you're losing the fourth position, and then you've got the Steelers at seven and five, Colts at seven and five, Browns at seven and five, and that rounds out 
the playoff, like you're in the playoff spots. Yeah. And then if you slide out of seven and five, slide past seven and five, you go to past the eighth spot and you're not even in the playoffs. Yeah. Yikes. This season just went disastrous depending on what happens with Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Like we'll get for this game, I mean, it can basically be summed up as Cincinnati showed up when everybody wrote him off and played with a very big chip on their shoulder. Jake Browning looked amazing. Yeah, he did. And this really was a fight to the finish. And went to overtime. Crazy kicking issues going on, too, with this game as well. I know McPherson did not have his greatest game of all time. Hey, listen, it didn't matter. My fantasy game was locked up by that point. Oh, exactly. But, you know, he he nailed the one he needed to win. Uh, let's, let's give him a shout-out. Jake Browning, the stud from the University of Washington mm-hmm. in his rookie year. Yeah, he played very, very good. Stud. Mm-hmm. But he did what he needed to do. They grinded a win out. Mm-hmm. Jacksonville, I'm sorry. I'm going to say something they don't want to hear. C.J. Beathard is not the guy. No. And if he has to be the guy, I I fear for your season. Uh-huh. He just did not look very comfortable there. Uh, let's see the depth chart. Let's see who else they got on their roster. Well, I don't think they have that much, and that's going to no, be the Christ, thing. Oh, Christ, no, they don't. The ESPN.com roster, their depth chart has literally Trevor Lawrence and C.J. Bathard. Now, of course, we can't see who's on their practice squad, so maybe there's a chance Sony's on their practice squad. Probably not, though. Well, the argument is going to be, let's call up uh, Jacksonville's schedule. Uh, I do have that up. Because we need to analyze what's going to happen <clears throat> here, because without Trevor Lawrence in that lineup, mm-hmm. We have to kind of say, can they win or are they going to lose? Like, let's let's play locks and leap here. Okay. That way. So their next game is this coming Sunday on the road playing the Cleveland Browns. If Lawrence is not there, that's an L. Okay. Next uh, week after that, week 15, Sunday, December 17th. This one on Sunday Night Football at home against the Baltimore Ravens. That'll be a definite L. Uh, week 16, Sunday, December 24th, on the road playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, coin flip, coin flip. So because it depends on which team for Tampa Bay shows up. All right, I'll say win. Uh, then you've got uh, week seventeen, which is Sunday, December thirty first, at home against the Carolina Panthers. Win, and then they close out the regular season Sunday, January seventh, on the road playing the Tennessee Titans. Uh, coin flip. I'll Pro. say loss. Okay. All right, so going by my record, they're going to go two and three rest of the season. So if they go two and three the rest of the season, that would put them at ten and seven. Yeah, they'll be outside looking in. Okay. Yeah, probably. They're they're not going to be able to do that and, and make a deep run. I'm sorry. And, the, and the, this is assuming you know because they said it'll be a couple of weeks, you know, before Lawrence is ready to come back because it's a high ankle sprain. High ankle sprain ain't nothing to fuck around with. We saw what happened a couple of years ago with Patrick Mahomes mm-hmm. in his high ankle sprain and how much that affected him. You don't have a couple of weeks to really hope he gets ready to come back for you. There's only one, two, three, four, five weeks left in the regular season. Yeah. Even if it's three weeks, which would put him, if he's out three weeks, so that would put him back. uh, He'd miss Cleveland. He'd miss Baltimore. He'd miss Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. That would put him back for Carolina and Tennessee, which is great and, and awesome for the Jacksonville fans. But at that point, it might be too little too late. Well, that's the issue you come across, and especially if you've got Cleveland and Baltimore yeah. the next two weeks. Baltimore's going to whoop the shit out of them. I don't care who's starting at quarterback that's, for Jackson. That's going to be the biggest problem. Beathard is not going to be able to handle that no. Baltimore defense. No. This is going to be... And, as, and Lamar and OBJ are going to eat that, that Jacksonville defense like it's a fucking crab cake. Well, that's the whole point. They're going to come in. Baltimore needs to win outright to get home field. Mm-hmm. That's going to be the problem they have because especially Miami right behind them. Yeah. Things are going to get very dicey there. But for Jacksonville, they have to win the stay in. Lawrence is not playing this week. Well, no, hell no. There's I, no chance. I just, yeah, there's no way. And I don't think they beat the Browns. I, I straight up don't think they do. Probably not. It'll be a close game because I don't think the Browns, I mean, with Flacco, who knows? Right. But. In this situation, I just don't see him beating them, and then I sure as hell don't see him beating Baltimore. Well, then it all depends on, you know, for Cleveland, there are other injuries, because I know Miles Garrett, last I heard, was still out, which, uh, let's see, looking at the Browns' injuries, uh, they got a defensive tackle, Maurice Hurst is listed as questionable, let's see, Kareem Hunt questionable, DTR questionable, Mari Cooper questionable, Denzel Ward, their cornerback questionable, Marquise Goodwin questionable. Uh, Michael Woods, the second one of their wide receivers, is out. So, I mean, at this point, who the hell isn't injured? But yeah, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be a tough task for either team. Right. I just think the Cleveland has a little more going for them. Yeah. yeah. They, they can squeak it out. Like I say, it's gonna be a close game. I I could honestly see it be a twelve nine. Yeah. 
I hate saying that, yeah, but... Yeah, it ain't going to be sexy. No, no, it's definitely not going to be a sexy game. And then for the team that won the Cincinnati Bengals the next couple of weeks, Week 14 uh, is at home against the Indianapolis Colts. Week 15 at home against the Minnesota Vikings. Week 16 on the road playing the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, that one will be a rare Saturday 4.30 NBC game, so mark your calendars for that one, Bengals mm-hmm. and Steelers fans. Uh, and then Christmas... Or not Christmas Eve, uh, New Year's Eve. Oh, oh boy. Uh, they are on the road playing the Kansas City Chiefs, and then they close out the regular season at home against the Cleveland Browns. Another tough task. If Browning is going to be the guy, he's got to lead them. Mm-hmm. Uh, this could go a lot of different ways, too. Mm-hmm. I don't think Cincinnati gets in, though. I really don't. Um, Probably not. Just too much against them right now. I think with that schedule, too. Sure, they can be Pittsburgh, but Kansas City, I don't see happening unless somehow Kansas City sits starters. Mm-hmm. But there's too much of a grudge there. Yeah. They're not sitting anybody. Nope. So it will be a tough task. It's not to say it's unovercomable, mm-hmm. if I may use that word. But it's a situation that Browning is going to need to find that magic from Joe Burrow, mm-hmm. make some stuff happen on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, it's a great win against Jacksonville, but albeit, though, it's one that should never have gone to overtime. Nope. And that's the problem they have. So moving forward, they're going to need to address it. But at least, as wild as it sounds, they're in better shape than Jacksonville currently is. Which is crazy. And it's wild to say that. Mm-hmm. Next up, though, we have to talk about the Cinderella team of the league. Yeah. The one that is surprising everybody. And if you're a fantasy football owner, you got to be very, very happy if you have some Houston Texans on your team. Well, Unless you got one in which you're not happy. Well, let's talk about it. Uh, yeah, so the Houston Texans beat the Denver Broncos 22-17. Uh, to 17. C.J. Stroud, 16-27, to 27, 274 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Russell Wilson, 15-26, 186 yards passing, one touchdown, three interceptions. Javante Williams led Denver in rushing with 13 carries, 46 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, Russell Wilson, though, 10 carries, 44 yards, one touchdown, so he had two total touchdowns on the day. For Houston, it was Damian Pierce, 15 carries, 41 yards, one touchdown. And then Nico Collins led Houston in receiving with nine catches, 191 yards receiving, one touchdown. Dude averaged two first downs a catch. Uh, and then on the other side for Denver, it was Cortland Sutton with two catches, 77 yards, and one touchdown. And the reason I brought up, you mentioned, oh, if you're a Houston Texans fan, or not a Houston Texans fan, oh, if you're a Houston Texans fan, yes, you're happy. But if you're a fantasy football owner with Houston Texans on your team, you're very happy. That is, unless you have one, Tank Dell. Yeah. The star receiver who has emerged for the Houston Texans is one of their leading receivers this year with 47 catches, 709 yards receiving, seven touchdowns uh, in his first year out of uh, he, the University of Houston on injured reserve for the year. Yeah, bad injury uh, for him. Bad, had a fibula injury. Yeah, so unfortunately the season is done. Mm-hmm. But with what you have with Houston right now, 7-5 and five on the verge of taking over the N- or AFC South. I mean, it, it, listen, the Jacksonville keeps slipping and Lawrence going to be out you know, the next couple of weeks depending on what happens with Indianapolis because Indianapolis is certainly playing scrappy these days and, mm-hmm. and winning very ugly. Uh, it's It's possible. It's definitely possible, but this was a great win for Houston, especially with Denver on that resurgence. Everybody thought Russell Wilson was back. Let's yeah. ride. Uh, let's not ride because this was a bad loss for them. Three interceptions and sacked three times. Yeah, I mean, he came back to earth, and that's the easiest way you can put it. I mean, yeah. Wilson, I don't want to say is a streaky quarterback at this stage. but He's I don't a streaky think, quarterback. But I don't think how you can go around it. I really don't. And I think to keep up with C.J. Stroud, who I love the bravado, Uh he's not afraid to get into a shootout on the field and really just kind of make stuff happen. Right. And he gets everybody involved. Like, you take a look at for all the receivers he threw to eight Uh on his entire team. He was spreading the ball around. Mostly everybody, but when Nico Collins stepped up, I mean, what are you going to do? Oh, I know. Yeah, of the 26 targets, uh, there were 17 catches, nine of them went to Nico Collins. Yeah, so what are you going to do about that? Yeah, hey, when you got the hot hand, you feed the hot hand. Exactly, and Stroud is emerging as a very, very solid NFL Stroud quarterback. Stroud probably a lock for uh, Offensive Rookie of the Year? I don't see how you can't. I really don't. The fact that he has resurrected this franchise. Uh, of a few years early. Yeah, way earlier than any of us thought. Currently leading the NFL in passing yards. Yep. Uh, he is. He has 3,000. 540 yards passing, which is ahead of Sam Howell at number two with 3,466. So it ain't it ain't like he's got Sam Howell by like you know 
a, a, a short check down pass. Now nah, it's it's a couple decent yards there. Well, the one thing that he is is fearless, and you can tell by the way he plays. And that's something you have to be excited about if you're a Houston fan. He is just showing no fear about anything, and he's really wielding this team to go some places. And he's coming close to that NFL record that uh, Andrew Luck set a number of years ago. Like I mentioned, uh, CJ Stroud currently has 3,540 yards passing. The rookie record for most passing yards in an NFL season was set by Andrew Luck, 2012, 4,374. I think he's going to shatter he's it. He's got a real good shot. I think he's going to do it, barring he, any injuries. He, need, yeah. he needs, so he's at 35, I'll just round numbers, 3,500. He needs to get to 4,300, so he still needs uh, 800 more passing yards. It's doable. 800 in five more games? Yeah. Yeah, he'll do that. You get, you get an even 200 every game. Depending on who he's got to face, I think that should be an easy task because he's just finding ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Denver is a very solid team. Sure, they went on that win streak, but, I mean, they're not great. Oh, Christ, I just looked at who he's got. Yeah, oh. yeah, he's got this. What has he got? Uh, so the Houston Texans, the next couple of weeks, uh, on Sunday, December 10th, week 14, they're on the road playing the New York Jets. Yeah, that will be 250 easy. Week 15, on the road playing the Tennessee Titans. Another 200. Week 16, at home against the Cleveland Browns. 200. Week 17, at home against the Tennessee Titans. 250. And then uh, week 18, on the road, playing the Indianapolis Colts. Eh, easy 200. So, yeah, you've averaged 200. He, he should have it. Yeah, he should have it he locked up. He should have it. Uh, and then for those Denver Broncos, looking at their schedule uh, the next couple of weeks, uh, this upcoming Sunday, they're on the road playing the Los Angeles Chargers. Week 15, they are <clears throat> excuse me, on the road playing the Detroit Lions. Week 16, uh, on New Christmas Eve, they are at home playing the New England Patriots. God help us all. Yeah. Week 17, on, Chris on New Year's Eve, they are at home playing the Los Angeles Chargers. And then week 18, on the road, playing the Las Vegas Raiders. Well, I think the Broncos season will be riding uh -huh. out, out into the sunset. I don't think they're going to do a lot of damage. I think it's all about Houston, and what a gutsy win to really lead this team, especially for Houston. They need this kind of momentum. Mm -hmm. And especially now with the fate of Jacksonville up in the air, I don't doubt Houston overtaking this division. Right. Barring any more injuries, I mean, that's going to be the one thing that they really have to watch. And if C.J. Stroud starts struggling – I, you know, if he starts kind of feeling fatigued in the arm, you know, just with how much he's been throwing, that's the only thing I'd be worried about right uh -huh. now. But other than that, huge win for them, waiting to see where they go next. Yeah. And then, obviously, the game that I think everybody had circled on their calendars for various reasons, you uh -huh. had the two best in the NFC. I don't think there's any question about it. Sorry, Dallas fans. It is what it is. But let's be honest, this past week, San Francisco, Philadelphia, the rematch. Jesus Christ. And this answered one question that lingered from last year. Uh-huh. If Brock Purdy was healthy, what would happen? Uh, well, whoever said it, you know, said, and I'm paraphrasing, if Brock Purdy was in that game, it wouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. We found out what happened with Brock Purdy in that whole game, and it was not the same. No, it definitely was not. San Francisco defeated the Philadelphia Eagles 42-19. to Brock Purdy, 19-27, 314 yards passing, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Jalen Hurts, 26-45, 298 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Jalen Hurts led Philly in rushing with seven carries, 20 yards, one touchdown. Christian McCaffrey led the way for San Francisco with 17 carries, 93 yards, just one touchdown. Debo Samuel led the way for San Francisco in receiving with six catches, a hundred and or excuse me, four catches, 116 yards receiving, two touchdowns, and then AJ Brown led the way for Philly, eight catches, 114 yards, and no touchdowns. Well, it's very simple. San Francisco came in with a grudge. Yeah, they did. The fact they came in wearing all black. Oh. Immediate statement. Yep. And I think that they really had this game circled because let's face it, this entire season thus far. Mm-hmm. Everybody has penciled Philadelphia in to go in the Super Bowl. After a couple of weeks, yeah. And obviously being nine and one at the t or ten and one at the time, mm -hmm. they they have a right to claim that. Yeah. Albeit though, if you watch a lot of Phillies games, they do get away with a lot of calls, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And this was a situation that the 49ers were not gonna let the any kind of, you know, second guessing of calls mm -hmm. ruin this. They wanted to come in there, wanted to punch them right in the mouth. And that's exactly what they did. Six straight possessions, six straight touchdowns. Yeah. Factor that all together. The vol the valued Philadelphia defense got punched in the mouth and had no reaction. I mean, it, it was, you know, a prime 
time prize fight, you know, two heavyweights going at each other. And it, and it's just the way the fight went down, you know, so to speak. It's it's the one one opponent got hit in the crucial part of the head, you know, and got staggered a little bit, started seeing stars and whatnot, and just never recovered. No, they definitely didn't. And this was a, a big moment for the 49ers mm-hmm. who need this, this win. If they want to get home field advantage, I mean, they're a game back from Philadelphia right now. Right. But they want to keep that momentum going because I, I, I'm i not backing down from my statement I said at the beginning of the year. I think 49ers are the team to beat in the NFC. Oh, yeah. And this game showed it. As long as McCaffrey, who is the true MVP of the league, sorry to break anybody's bubbles there. Oh, my God. The number, like even, the, what was it, the fucking thing that came out that – now Brock Purdy is the Vegas favorite to win MVP for what? Like, listen, Brock Purdy's having a good year. Let's let's, you know, not you know call, cast any shade on the guy. You know, looking at his stats for the year, he's got three three thousand one hundred eighty three yards passing, twenty three touchdowns, six interceptions. It's a good year. It's mm-hmm. a, lot, a, a lot of quarterbacks and a lot of coaches and coordinators would take that year. Yeah. But the thing I think you got to asterisk it is he's having a, he's got a lot of guys around him who are having phenomenal years as well, which fucking helps. You got Christian McCaffrey who had whatever the streak was for games with a touchdown, which was almost an NFL record. He tied it. He didn't break it. You got Debo Samuel is having a great year rushing and receiving. That fucking helps. Mm-hmm. You got George Kittle who ain't having a bad year, and you got Brandon Ayuk who ain't having a bad year. Oh, by the way, you've got those guys on defense that are just absolutely fucking lights out no matter what. So I listen. Is is Purdy having a great year? Yeah, but when you've got all those other things clicking for you at the same time, it helps. In my opinion, don't get me wrong. Christian McCaffrey, great year, fantastic year. Arguably, though, just a side tangent. My my MVP of the year, Tyree Kill. No, uh, you can make an argument for because him. Tyree Kill right now leads the NFL in receiving with one thousand four hundred and eighty-one yards receiving. Mm-hmm. The NFL record is Calvin Johnson in 2012 with 1,964 yards. Nobody in the NFL has ever hit 200, two, excuse me, 2,000 yards receiving. There's a shot because we got five more weeks. Mm-hmm. And as dynamic and as explosive as Miami's offense is, there's a shot he could hit 2,000 yards. Which, think about it, the NFL has been around 100 plus years. Mm hmm. Never happened. You think of some of the names that have come through, you know, the locker rooms and onto the fields of the NFL. Your Jerry Rice's, your your Randy Moss's, you you know, your uh your Calvin Johnson's, you know, your uh I forget the guy's first name, but Carter. Oh, Chris Carter. Chris Carter, you know, your Chris Carter, Terrell Owens, Chad Johnson's. You know, you could just go all day with a list of the legendary receivers. Mm-hmm. None of them have ever done it. And yet we got a guy who could do it. So listen, Purdy, no. He's had a great year, but that's when you got all the pieces around him. You can make an argument for McCaffrey. I agree with you. McCaffrey, when you when you get that close to breaking an NFL record for what he did with touchdowns in a game, mm-hmm. should be, like if we're doing like the Heisman vote, should be one of those candidate, final candidates for the MVP voting. Mm-hmm. But for me, Tyreek Hill. No, that's a great argument too. But I will say this, who is the better team right now? Miami or San Francisco? Oh, if we're talking total teams, it's San Francisco. Right. Here's the thing. If you take Tyreek Hill out of the Miami offense, sure. they're okay. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. they still have Waddle. Yeah. They've got that great running back duo. Oh, yeah. They got a, a Kane or a Chain. Yeah, or a, a Chain and, and Morstert. They're okay. <laughs> My opponent in fantasy this week left a uh, Kane on the bench. Yeah. Whoops. Well, you got to watch those injury reports early. Mistakes were made. Right. But when you take a look at San Francisco, you take a look at how this team was before McCaffrey got there. Yeah. And then if he's not in the lineup. That's the key factor. He causes so much for that offense to go that if you take him out of there, I'll make a bold statement right now. They're mediocre. Okay. It's the truth, though. It might not look like the sexiest stat line. But he makes so much happen that it gets Debo Samuel time. You can do the end rounds. You can do a lot of, you know, smoke and mirror plays. I mean, when they didn't have McCaffrey, they had Debo, who wasn't bad as he a was, running back. He wasn't bad. But McCaffrey's on a whole different level. Right. And when you have to focus so much attention on him, yeah, that now opens up for Debo to be Debo. That opens up a lot for Kittle. Ayuk is playing a lot better. Because teams have to focus so much on McCaffrey. I mean, especially when you have two running backs that are both dynamic 
runners and receivers mm. with, with with Debo and McCaffrey. I mean, I'm pulling up their stats now. Uh, but for Christian McCaffrey this year, and this is this is just you know receiving. Mm. This isn't. Uh, rushing he has uh 51 receptions on 62 targets for 429 yards receiving and five receiving touchdowns yeah on the flip side for debo samuel and again this is just receiving uh sorry he's got a few stats here uh, there it is for debo just receiving he's got 38 receptions on 53 targets for 590 yards and three touchdowns so on the year, he's got seven touchdowns total uh, offensively. No passing because he's got passing stats. No passing touchdowns. Yeah, he's got he's got seven touchdowns total this year. Like that's hard to plan against when you're the defensive coordinator. Oh, absolutely. It's crazy to try planning against, and that's why they run so well with him. Yeah. And you take a look at what they did to the one of the best defenses in all the game. Yeah. They tore through Philadelphia. Like, it wasn't fun. Believe me, I'm aware. I didn't watch the game, but I went to New York City on a bus trip this past weekend, and sitting behind me were a couple of San Francisco 49ers fans. So I'm well aware of what happened during that oh, game. Oh, they're in their renaissance. There's nothing wrong with it. But it just if you're a Philly fan, it was a long day because you had no answer. And your, your high-scoring offense could never really get off the ground. I mean, Brown and Smith had a great game. So don't get yeah, it wrong. Yeah, which, <laughs> in other news, water's wet. Right, but when your leading rusher is Hurts yeah. with 20 yards, yeah, there's only so much of the brotherly shove you can do, it's not going to get the job done. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. When you become one-dimensional against a team like the 49ers, you're already done. It's already a wrap. And for Philly, they will bounce back. There's no question about it. But when they wind up meeting again in the playoffs, because I fully think they're going to. Oh, absolutely. They had better come up with a different game plan because otherwise the 49ers are just going to do wash, rinse, repeat and punch their ticket to the Super Bowl. Easy. At the same time, though, this could be a game that in a couple of weeks or even come playoff time, we could be looking back on and going, that was the moment they figured it out. That was the moment everything started clicking for them. Oh, sure. Oh, absolutely. Just- Which is wild to say about a team that's 10-2, and two, but this could be a, you know, Season defining game for these guys. See, I thought, because because if I if, speaking as a Patriots fan who's watched them win six Super Bowls, I much prefer to them to have this moment in season mm-hmm. than in any week of the playoffs. Figure this shit out and get the kinks worked out and have that like defining moment where everything comes together and you get that wake up call. Yeah, in season. Don't do it in the in you know the second round of the playoffs or the championship game or the Super Bowl. Do it in season. Well, that's the old key thing, too, because I thought the 49ers were going to go easy here and not reveal everything. No, they, they gave the whole offense away. Right. So now Philly needs to adjust and adapt. Right. Point blank. Looking at these team, uh, team schedules the next couple of weeks, then to close out the season, uh, this upcoming Sunday, the uh, San Francisco 49ers are at home against the Seattle Seahawks. Week 15, they are on the road playing the Arizona Cardinals. Week 16, so that is Christmas Day, uh, Monday, December 25th. Uh, at home, Monday Night Football on ABC, ESPN, ESPN Plus, the whole nine. Probably be a man and cast for this one, too. Baltimore Ravens. Ooh, that'd be fun. <laughs> Happy Christmas to uh, all you NFL fans. Mm-hmm. Week 17, uh, New Year's Eve, they'll be on the road playing the Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. God help you, Commanders. Yep. Uh, and then they close out the regular season, weeks, week 18, at home against the Los Angeles Rams. Then for those Philadelphia Eagles, well, they ain't got much time to dwell on anything because this upcoming Sunday, Sunday Night Football, on the road, NBC, Dallas Cowboys. Huge game this week. Woo-hoo. Huge. Take the over on that game. Gonna tell you right now. Yeah. Uh then you got week fifteen. Again, primetime football. Monday night football on ABC and ESPN. You they are on their own playing. Seattle Seahawks. Mm. I would love to see, I don't know if there's gonna be one. I would love to see a Manning cast with this one and put Marshawn Lynch on there. Yes. All I'm going to say. Yes. Week uh, 16, this is on Christmas Day. You've got them at home against the New York Giants. Week 17, on New Year's Eve, they are at home against the Arizona Cardinals, and then they close out the regular season on the road playing the New York Giants. Hmm. Well, I think these two are going to wind up meeting again sooner than later. Probably. But in the meantime, though, I think their, their road to the playoff is pretty safe. They just have to watch out for injuries. Yes, they and do. And that's the big takeaway I got for this one. Yes, they do. 
All right, so before we get on out of here, we have to recap the week that was. So, Pad, let's take it away. Uh, yeah, so the Thursday night football game was actually decent for once. Yeah. Where you had the Dallas Cowboys beat the uh, Seattle Seahawks 41-35. to uh, Defense in this game, optional. Geno Smith, 334 yards passing, three touchdowns, one interception. Dak Prescott, 299 yards passing, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, running, eh, Tony Pollard, 68 yards, rushing, one touchdown. Uh, Zach uh, Charbonnet, I'm guessing is how you say that, uh, mm. 60 yards, rushing, one touchdown. DK Metcalf, 134 yards, receiving, three touchdowns. Uh, C.D. Lamb, 116 yards, one touchdown. Jake Ferguson for Dallas, 77-1. and one. Brandon Cooks, 45-1. and one. God damn. Well, I think it always seems every year there's always one crazy high-scoring game on Thursday night. This is like watching uh, one of the first two Rocky movies, and Rocky's facing Apollo Creed. Oh, yeah. No. And, and it's like the end of the fight where like every fight, or every punch that gets thrown, you know, the music, it's da-da, yeah. da-da. Yeah, exactly. That's what it was. It was just a high-scoring affair. Yeah. Dallas is lucky they came away with this one. Seattle, oh. Seattle. I mean, take nothing away from the effort. They were trying their best with what they had, a lot of injuries on their side. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, big win for Dallas, and they needed this one desperately, uh-huh. too. Uh-huh. So, uh, then you've got, uh, what is it, the Indianapolis Colts beat the Tennessee Titans 31-28. to Well, a battle of... Ugh, Mm-hmm. But Indy is coming on at the right time. It's an overtime win, so you know that Tennessee was going to give them all they had. I just think, unfortunately, at this stage, Tennessee's wrapped. They're going to be doing a big rebuild this offseason. Uh-huh, which, hey, uh, congratulations, DeAndre Hopkins. Great choice. Yeah. Uh, the Detroit Lions beat the New Orleans Saints 33-28. to Detroit bounced back win, and obviously they needed it. New Orleans is not the New Orleans of old, but still this is a win that Detroit needs if they really want to establish themselves as playoff contenders. And some concern for Derek Carr, obviously, as he went uh, Yeah. Uh, so he's currently listed as questionable with a concussion, rib, and right shoulder injury. He practiced in a limited capacity on Wednesday. John Hendricks of SI.com reports. Yeah, not good. No. Uh, then you had the Atlanta Falcons beat the New York Jets 13-8. to Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta got a win. Yeah, they did. And the Jets, oh, oh boy. The Jets are bad aye, all around. Aye, There's aye, not aye, anything aye, nice aye, to say aye, about aye, them right aye, now. Aye. The turmoil that has been reported is only getting worse. Zach Wilson is starting, although if you li- if you read reports earlier this week, that didn't sound like it was going to be a certainty. Yeah, that's... Sounded... The, gu- the guy who started the last two games for them, Tim Boyle, got released. Yeah. Uh, they signed Brett Reifian, who is not even listed as their fucking... Second string quarterback in this situation. He's the third stringer. God, who would have thought? Aaron Rodgers just turned 40 years old the other day. The Jets' hopes and prayers uh, were resting on a 40 year old quarterback. Yeah, I think. Where he have com- I heard that before? I think he comes back, plays two games, then bows out. Could be. I think there's just too much drama with the Jets right Could now, be. unfortunately. Uh, then you had the Arizona Cardinals beat the Pittsburgh Steelers in the most weather cursed game of the week 24 to 10. Our guy Rich from 3FN was down at the game, actually. That's why I say that. Yep. Two weather delays. Yeah. Not good. Not a good game. Pittsburgh, injuries have happened. Mm-hmm. Maserati, I don't know if he's going to be able to lead them to the playoffs. Uh, I could see that how stacked the AFC North was. I think that's going to be falling apart, and I think Pittsburgh is unfortunately going to be feeling that. Remember how we were saying just a minute ago, hey, we finally had a good Thursday night football game? Yeah. The Thursday night football game this week, fucking polar opposite. It's going to be dog shit. Pittsburgh and New England. Ooh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Ugh. Ask me if I'm watching that. No, you're not watching. Oh that. hell no! I know. I know oh, you're not watching. Hell that. no! Hell no! No, I'll, I'll I'll pay attention. You know, with notifications and you know box scores. Maybe, I mean. maybe you should come down for Wrestling Night Live to get your palate off it. Uh, maybe we'll see. Uh, then you had the Miami Dolphins beat the Washington Commanders forty-five to fifteen. Bum 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 bum. What? I, I, we don't even need to dwell about this. Miami what is doing Miami the math things. On this? I'm trying to figure out the scores they had by halftime because it was 17 to nothing after the first quarter, and then they Miami put up another uh, 14 in the second quarter. So 31. Uh, yeah, 31 to seven at halftime. <laughs> Yikes! Washington is bad on defense. They gave away their key players. I mean, yeah, and you can't stay. Yeah. Keeping you can't keep up with the highest pow- powered offense in the league right Ron now. Ron Rivera probably on his way out. For, yeah, for no fault of his own. No, definitely not. I think it's unfortunately. I think they're going to make a change at the guard there. Yeah, yeah. And I think if they're smart, they really make Benemy a real great offer to stay. Oh, and you I, better hope so. I know. Now he's become. He'll set that. He'll set that team back a couple decades. I think the scariest thing that could happen is Benemy to the Chargers. 
Oh, my. Oh, Jesus. I think that could be the Ooh. scariest one two combo in recent memory. I know there was talk about him possibly to Chicago. No, 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 no. I think all this nonsense about the Chargers. Well, I think the Chargers are going to get a new head coach regardless. I think oh, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's yeah, done. Yeah. But Betamy out there with Herbert in that offense is going to be outright scary. Mm -hmm. And I would not doubt them dropping 40 a game. Mm -hmm. Not saying they're going to win every game because they'll probably find a way to lose 43 to 40. Right. They're going to put 40 easy in their sleep. I've heard the Benemy name. The other name I've heard floated out there for both teams, Chicago and the Chargers, is uh, Jim Harbaugh. Given whatever happens with Michigan, because that's still a whole Mm -hmm. can of worms. You know, he could say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to run away and go to uh, either the Chargers or the Bears. The Bears is going to be the more interesting one if he goes there because somebody in the front office, it's not the owner, but somebody in the front office of that organization it has ties to the Big Ten and they have some not-so-nice things to say about each other. Yeah. So it could be a, we might have to bury the hatchet. So we'll see. I would say this, not to get too sidetracked because I know we're going to talk college football a little later. Mm-hmm. I think he does leave if he gets them to a national championship game. Okay. I think at that point... I think he's going to bow out regardless. Okay. Because I think if he's ever, if he really wants to coach in the pros Mm -hmm. and and do that, like that, if that's his passion to go there, to try it again, to try it again, rather, I should say. Yeah. Then he's going to go because he's not going to have a better opportunity to go. I mean, let's let's face it. You know, for all his shit and all his antics he's he's pulled in college, he did kind of bring in you know the dual threat or popularize the dual threat quarterback before it became a thing or mm-hmm. revitalize it i guess oh, I, yeah. I should say not to cast shade on any shade on michael vick but you know he you know when he benched alex smith all those years ago and everyone went why the fuck are you benching alex smith for colin kaepernick and then ended up leading him to a super bowl yeah and, like, now, and now you look at so many teams in the nfl and they have you know lamar jackson and, and, and jalen Ky- hurts jalen hurts kyler murray how many quarterbacks can run with their legs and also bomb it you know 50 60 yards downfield yeah, no, Harbaugh is a great coach and to do that perspective. And you saw what he did with the college game. I just think if he gets to a, a point where it's just like with everything that's been going on with mm-hmm. the drama there, mm-hmm. I could see him leaving just saying, you know what, I want to go back. I want yeah. I want to finish my legacy out with something else. Yeah, I could see it. And I, like I say, Chicago would be a great landing spot for him. Mm-hmm. Who knows if there'll be a surprise team that pops up. Dude beat Ohio State twice in Michigan. I, He's already a legend in the state of Michigan. I mean, as much as I would hate to see Antonio Pierce – Get uh, not get the opportunity. Yeah, I would say this: he'd come in and clean up the Raiders really quick. Yeah, yeah. Just have to wait and see, but yeah, I think he'll be a hot name going around there as much as Betamy is, and especially I wouldn't let the offense performance here fool anybody. It's just Washington has no defense. No, they don't. That's the easy way you could say it. Then you had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeat the Carolina Panthers twenty-one to eighteen. The fact this game was that close is atrocious. Tampa mm-hmm. Bay needed to put up a, a, at least seven on them. Mm-hmm. This is a joke. I'm sorry. Uh, then you had the L.A. Rams beat the Cleveland Browns thirty-six to nineteen. Well, Cleveland is struggling. Yeah, they a are. A lot of injuries. Although Flacco, decent game. Two fifty-four, two touchdowns, one interception. Decent game. The Ram- bad. The Rams are just trying to finish out strong. Yeah. But I think Cleveland, I'd be a little concerned. Mm-hmm. I'd be really concerned. But yeah. we'll have to see. I, like I said, I think they could beat Jacksonville this week. If they can't beat Jacksonville, I would be hitting that panic button really fast. Then the last game we got to talk about since your Buffalo Bills were off, although we don't really have to spend much time on it, was the worst game of the NFL, which if you sat there and watched this entire game, who the fuck hurt you? Yeah. Like, why? The uh, L.A. Chargers beat the New England Patriots 6 to nothing. All that matters about this is the Patriots lost, the Cardinals win, the Patriots have now... Uh, a firm grasp on the number two overall pick in the NFL. So Carolina, get your shit together. Pick up a couple more wins. Why do I say Carolina? Because they technically have the number one overall draft pick, but it's going to the Chicago Bears because of the DJ Moore trade they did. Mm -hmm. I want the number one overall. That's all we need to say. Yeah, no, I have nothing to say about it. I'm sorry, Patriots fans. This, This is bad. And Chargers, I don't know why you'd be celebrating either. I'm just going to put that out there. I mean, listen, for as bad as the Patriots are, you know, at least I had Penn State doing fairly well, so I could watch that. Rangers are obviously clicking very well. Yeah. You know, MLB Hot Stove, which we'll get to later in the show, 
clicking. So I got I got enough to focus on the like the Patriots doing shitty isn't like drowning my entire season. No, no, I I, I, I got I got enough going on that I'm like you know what Patriots can suck. It's I, fine. it's fine. I agree with. You. I mean the Patriots we knew we were going to have struggles. I didn't think anybody expected them to be this bad. When 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 they started doing well and and, and my fandom kind of picked up on them. You know, I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I went through middle school, high school, and college, and they did well, I can't really complain. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, join a, a suffering franchise like the Bills, sit through the E.J. Manuel years, the J.P. Lossman years, <laughs> Rob Johnson. I'll say, you, you guys could do much like there's that Cleveland Browns uh, jersey that's, mm-hmm. that's in a storefront somewhere with all their starting quarterbacks. You guys could do one about as long. But sorry, we got Josh Allen, the modern day Brett Favre. We'll be fine. <laughs> just give him, just give him the Wrangler jeans and uh, have him thrown through a, the one commercial there. He was thrown through the, oh, the tire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he'll be yeah. fine. That's all we need. That's all we need. Just give him that and, and some tables to break. We'll fine. Interesting week of football, nevertheless. So make sure to hit us up on that hashtag hashtag ODPH Pod. How is your team doing going into the final stretch of the season? It's December now. And there's a lot of storylines left to be had with the NFL. And obviously, week 13 made some headlines. So let's talk about it, shall we? But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do you like comic books? What about movies and TV shows? Well, we may be the show for you. We're Hops Geek News, a weekly podcast that discusses comics, movies, and TV shows while featuring a beer of the week. Every week, we chat about what we messed up on the week before. And then we dive into what we're reading and watching, as well as some news. We then wrap it up with a geek-themed topic of the week. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts by searching Hops Geek News. Cheers. Cheers. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and we have to talk college football Mm -hmm. because we now have the final four for the national championship lined up to go because now we have entered bowl season. Mm -hmm. So, Pat, who we got in the final four cut here? Uh, So your number one team is the Michigan Wolverines. Number two, the Washington Huskies, both of those teams at 13-0. and 0. Uh, Number three, the Texas Longhorns at 12-1. and 1. And number four, the Alabama Crimson Tide at 12-1. and 1. Uh, Then your first two out are, you know, missed the cut, I guess you could say. Mm. Uh, the Florida State Seminoles at number five with 13-0. and 0, And then the Georgia Bulldogs at 12-1. A little bit of controversy here with Florida State. So we do have to address that. Mm-hmm. Being 13-0 and 0 on the outside looking in and Alabama gets in is definitely something I'm not cool with. Okay. And I understand Alabama got the SEC championship, sure, but I think in comparison, it just doesn't add up. I mean, see, here's the thing. Like, Alabama won the SEC championship. Cool. But so did Florida State. Florida State won the ACC championship. Here's the thing, though. Uh, so Alabama beat Georgia, number one ranked Georgia this past weekend, 27-24. Uh, and then on the same day in the ACC championship, Florida State beat Louisville 16-6. to Florida State should have whooped the shit out of Louisville. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Louisville hasn't been good since... A couple of years ago, when I forget who their quarterback, I forget who their was it Lamar was it Lamar Maybe Louisville? Lamar Jackson. Yeah, since Lamar Jackson was at Louisville, Louisville not known for basketball or excuse me football, they're known for basketball. Mm-hmm. Flip side, Alabama. Who listen? It's it's Alabama. Roll Tide. Roll all that other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> they beat the number one ranked team in the country, back to back national champions who had not lost a game in two or two and a half years. It's a hell of a statement there. But the thing of it is, like the other thing too is with this this college playoff committee, and this is the thing that sucks. We don't know the criteria to get in there. Right, you never do. If you look at the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, hell, even MLS, you know, the English Premier League, the UEFA Champions League, practically any other league on planet Earth, you know the criteria to get in to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. You know, or to get into some other league. Like I know English Premier League, if you're in the top four places in the standings, you get to play in the UEFA Champions League next season. Right. Per- pretty even and clear cut. Like there's no mystery. There's no, oh, we're going to do, you know, one of the ping pong balls out of the machine and pick a random four teams from the English Premier League. Like, no, it's it's clear cut. Top four teams. You know, if, if you're in the NFL, top four, you know, each division winner gets a four seed. And then after that, we figured it out, figure it out based on record. The shitty thing with college football, and even college basketball to a certain degree, because there's a little bit of uncertainty with college basketball, not necessarily to the degree of college football. Mm -hmm. We don't know the criteria to get in there. And one of the things I think that's obviously an unspoken criteria, because you know they'd never say this publicly, 
They're a business at the end of the day. Sure. They want to make money. They want to bring in ratings. They want to bring in viewers. And yeah, Florida State's a great story. And it's a great season for them. And I don't want to take any of that away from them. But at the same token, though, look what happened last year with TCU. Mm-hmm. Cinderella, you know, the slipper fit. They're going to the ball. They're going to the dance, whatever, you know, metaphor you want to use. They beat Michigan in the first round of the playoff to go to the national title game. Who knows if it was their first time playing for a national championship game in football, but whatever. They then got run out of the building like 65 to 7. Yeah. I mean, and in what was one of the least watched college football playoff games in recent memory like i remember being at least a little excited for this because i'm like oh shit it's tcu like it's david versus goliath here you don't know what the fuck's gonna happen it was over by about the second quarter well i mean the argument you have is about the playoff system and how it's selected i mean that's Mm -hmm. that's the biggest problem you have especially with how many teams are in division one football sure and to pick four somebody is gonna be outside looking in well that's why they're switching to 12 next year and it's a smart move to do I'm not saying you got to go complete March Madness here. Oh, God, we'd be here all month. But Oh, wait, we already are. But I think they, they do have to expand it. And I think, I mean, I granted, I love the fact they're actually doing playoffs instead of just going based off the AP polls right. and, and all that nonsense because right. that doesn't give you a true test. Uh, so just for argument's sake, in case you're curious, so if they were to do the playoff system with 12 teams this season, your teams would be Michigan, Washington, Texas, Alabama, Florida State, Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, Missouri, Penn State, Ole Miss, and Oklahoma rounding out the top 12. So you'd have Michigan at 13-0 and all the way down to Oklahoma at 10-2. and Yeah. I mean, it, it's a tough call to do because you don't want to do it during the regular season and all that. And right. obviously you're not going as long as the NFL is. But it's a situation that they have to work on and get the right teams in there. Mm-hmm. Because I just think it's it's a tough sell to put Alabama in there. I mean, well, the, the, I understand. Well, I understand your argument. Though. Right, right, right. No, the other thing too is there's also never going to be any satisfying people. Oh, sure. Because when you had the old BCS system, there was always every year. Well, there was a couple of years where people were like, no, they got it right. There, it seemed like almost every year, you know, there was oh, so and so should have won it over, should have got it over such and such. This team's not the actual national champion. That team is because Team B had a better record and all this than Team A. So then they went, all right, compromise. You you don't like the BCS system? We'll do a college football playoff system. And everyone's like, all right, we're finally going to get a playoff. It's finally going to be an even playing field. And I knew it was going to happen as soon as they announced it. It's gonna be, it's, it was going to be the same stuff you hear every season from the college basketball playoffs. Is, oh, why didn't this team get in? They mm-hmm. had they had better wins. They had a better strength of schedule. They had a better you know win percentage. They had a better this, better that. Like. Even if they expand to 12, there's still going to be gripes and arguments because you're going to get a scenario where you're on that 12th spot and it's going to be, you got two teams that are, we'll just say 10 and two, because that's what the teams are this season. You know, that's what the team record is at the 12th seed this season. You know, it's going to come down to, well, they have to pick somebody and it's not like the NFL where I can go to the NFL standings right now and look at the playoff stand. I'll even pull it up right now. You can go to the NFL standings, switch it over to the playoff picture and let's just find one. So top seven teams get in. There's not one there. All right. Perfect. Green Bay Packers are currently the number seven seed in the NFC. They are tied with the Los Angeles Rams and the Seattle Seahawks, six and six. Mm. There's no mystery of who gets into the playoffs for the uh, for the NFL. I can read right here: the Green Bay Packers win a tiebreaker over the LA Rams based on head-to-head win percentage. The division tiebreak was initially used to eliminate Seattle. The LA Rams win the tiebreak over Seattle based on head-to-head win percentage. Clear cut. Little confusing with the wordage there, right? But enough you can get there. But enough you can get there. We're gonna run it like everyone's gonna be all excited and hyped that we're switching this twelve team playoff, and finally there's not gonna be a team that should have gotten in and got snubbed. And blah blah blah. We're gonna run into one of these scenarios though, and people are just gonna get pissy again, and they're gonna want to expand it again. Well, that's the argument you're gonna have no matter what. But I think the fact here is if you got a somewhat level playing field. For what you have, and it, it, but you go out based off the strength of schedule and conference, mm-hmm. like that's the argument you have. And unfortunately, there's only a couple powerhouse conferences in college football. Mm-hmm. So unless you're having those teams cross over to face the other conferences, you're not getting a true test of the, the league. And I think, unfortunately, in this case, the, the ACC, granted, is now known more for the its 
basketball basketball than it is it's um football right, football yeah that i think unfortunately florida state is is getting shunned for it mm-hmm. but they shouldn't if you're still that undefeated team but it's just a matter of if alabama sneaks in because they got one big win doesn't make everything right and that's that's the argument you have and it's a tough debate sure it really is because you can't sit there and say an undefeated team does deserves to be out if they are facing top competition that's the argument in in this case here, where Alabama, who had one loss, and unfortunately wins and losses do really matter oh, at this yeah. stage. Oh yeah, the fact they get in because they got a big win over Georgia. Mm-hmm. It's a tough sell, especially with how everything was structured. Because if I'm not mistaken, the week prior, Florida State was number four ranked. So that's something like that, yeah. And then they got booted out. But how do you get booted out if you if you didn't lose? You know, like right. That's the problem you have here. And I know it's causing a lot of friction with fans, and rightfully so. I think you have a legit argument. But like you touched upon, too, you can't put everybody in. No. And no matter how hard you try, it's not going to pan out. No. Because, I mean, if you take them out, then what do you say with Georgia? Right. Because, I mean, Georgia, I mean, what is their record? Georgia is 12-1. Uh, and one. Right. So they're technically like Alabama. So how, yeah. how do they get in? Oh, that's right. They beat Alabama beat them head-to-head. Yeah. All right, well, that justifies that, but... Does that well, just Al- Alabama twelve and one? Their one loss was to Texas, right? So, when you start factoring all that in, I mean, your top three make a lot of sense, mm-hmm. but that fourth spot—that's where it gets real dicey, right? Well, and then, and then the other thing of it too is, you know, I, I've heard—I know Kirk Herbstreit threw it around during the broadcast on uh, Sunday, where they're revealing this, and one of the factors, I guess, that plays into this is like all the availability of players and coaches, mm-hmm. you know, whether because I know there's a couple players on Penn State guy. I know there's at least one, maybe two players right now that have announced for Penn State's bowl game, uh, which I believe they're going to the Peach Bowl, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, there's at least one or two players from Penn State that aren't going to play the Peach Bowl game, which, hey, fine, that's your choice. Like, is what it is, you know. But when you're already down the starting quarterback for Florida State, you're, mm-hmm. you're on your backup. Are you going to have these other guys who are starters who are looking at going into the NFL and looking at getting drafted and want to be able to show out at Pro Day, Senior Bowl, Combine? Are they really going to want to risk injury and all that for a meaningless game that, you know, might mean something, might not mean something? And, and do you really want to risk? Because I really think after what happened last year mm-hmm. where they let Cinderella in the dance – and then it came back and it bit him in the ass. Well, I'm sure that is haunting them a little bit. I mean, it has to. But you also have to think about with these players, were they really dedicated to the team or themselves? I mean, that's an argument that you have to have. Outside looking in, mm-hmm. you have to consider that. But at this stage, too, they have to think about their futures. And obviously, if they're planning on leaving school to go to the pro level, they have to take care of themselves. It's just an argument about like what mattered more to you, playing out or, or taking care of yourself, which there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, that's the only downside about this argument here. You can't really say there's a clear-cut path. Mm-hmm. I mean, take a look at today, how many players entered the portal. Oh, God, like 3,000. 3,000. Well, something insane like that. Yeah. So what is that telling you? I mean, hell, there's talk that fucking uh, the Manning kid might leave Texas. Yeah. It's really crazy to start thinking about everything that involves with this, but this is just a domino effect, in my opinion, coming out of this, the playoff system. And unless you really give some incentive to keep people at schools, mm-hmm. if you're just j- basing it off you know, the top four, right. and I know expanding it will hopefully help, but to what degree? Because then we're going to have to watch next year about how many players are leaving for the portals. Yep. And what is in there, and obviously now with NILs and all that jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, it's a different ball game. Mm-hmm. But just getting back to the basics here, did they get the count right for the top four teams? I don't know. I don't think they did. Do you? I mean, I think they. I think for the most part, yeah. I mean, I get why Florida State should have been in there. But just when I look at the two te- the teams they played up against the teams Alabama, because let's face it, it was it came down to them or Alabama. Mm-hmm. And I look at the teams Florida State played, and I look at the teams that Alabama played. It's a stronger argument for Alabama. Just because it it wasn't exactly there was a, there was a couple of close wins. I mean, let's let's not sugarcoat it. You mm-hmm. know, uh, they had the the they had the three point win against Auburn the week well not last this weekend but the weekend prior. You know, they beat uh, Kentucky forty nine twenty one, LSU forty two twenty eight, Tennessee thirty four twenty, Arkansas twenty four twenty one, Texas A and M twenty six twenty, Mississippi State forty to seventeen, Ole Miss twenty four ten. 
Uh, South Florida, 17 to three. They had the one loss, like I mentioned, to Texas, 34 24. Middle Tennessee, obviously, they whooped the shit out of them, mm. 56 to seven. And then they had Chattanooga uh, before the Auburn game where they beat them 66 to 10. But those are games they should win. Yeah. You know, I look at those, and, and some of those are pretty decent football schools these days. They're not great, they're pretty decent football schools. But you, you put that up against what Florida State went up against. And listen, I'm not trying to take anything away from Florida State. They had a great season and they deserved everything. You know, they, they yeah, they, they should be in the college football play. But when I put them up against Alabama, Alabama's got the stronger argument for me. Mm. It's a great debate, folks. So we definitely want to hear your opinions about this. So hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. How did you think the college football Final Four matched up? Do you think Alabama should have got in? Do you think Florida State should have? What is the question here? Like, this is where we need to have this debate. And what are you thinking about everybody transferring out through the portals? What are you thinking about the bowl season in general? What games are you looking forward to? Let's have that conversation, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideman Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name? Coming back for a final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about, first of which is obviously the local minute. And looking at the standings for the Federal Prospects Hockey League, that is, of course, the league our local Binghamton Black Bears play in, and specifically the Empire Division. Mm -hmm. Another week, first place. Yeah, let's go. Uh, In 15 games played, the Binghamton uh, Black Bears have a record of 10 wins in regulation, one loss, and then three losses in uh, either overtime or shootout. With uh, So that gives them 35 points. They're ahead of Motor City in second place, who has 28 points. Danbury in third uh, with 22 points. And then Watertown in fourth with 17 points. And Elmira, sorry Elmira, still in last place with seven points. Uh, mm. Looking at their schedule from this past week, had a couple of games going on. Uh, they had the game... Or, they, uh, there it is. Uh, yeah, they only had the one game, excuse me. Uh, they had the game on Friday, December 1st, which was at 7 o'clock Eastern. Uh, this was a home game against Elmira, where they won by the final score of 6-4. to four. Let's go. Uh, they got a couple games this upcoming weekend, both of them on the road. However, uh, first is Friday, December 8th, 7.35 p.m. Eastern. They are on the road playing the Carolina Thunderbirds. Then they're back again on Saturday, December 9th, 6.05 p.m. Eastern, playing those same Carolina Thunderbirds. They do return home, however, not too far away. Uh, Friday, December 15th, 7 o'clock Eastern against the Danbury Hat Tricks. Uh, I'd read you promos and tell you anything they got cool going on promotionally, but they still don't have a promotion schedule up. It's like a month and a half into the season. Uh, work on your stuff there. I, I think they face. should, at this point, I know people from that organization do listen to the show. I think they should just mail it to us. Mail it to us or update your site because yeah. I, I would love to give people an incentive to go because, hey, there might be, you know, Disney nights some parent might like to take their kids. or Star. I know Star Wars nights a staple in sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, uh, put out your promotional schedule. It'd help. Yeah. Uh, then we got to talk some baseball because the MLB hot stove. Boy, she's a cooking. Oh, it's cooking. Holy shit. Uh, it's cooking. Carefully, you might burn your hand out over the stove. Uh, a couple deals to talk about first that have gone down in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the New York Mets signed right-hander Luis Severino uh, for a one-year $13 million contract. Of course, he had spent uh, his entire previous eight seasons with the New York Yankees. Uh, did not have a great year in 2023. 6.65 ERA over 89 and one-third innings. Uh, hey, good deal for him. Mm-hmm. He gets paid. Good luck if he stays healthy, because if he stays healthy, great pitcher. If he stays healthy, it's a great move, but unfortunately, he has not been able to do that. No, he and, no, he has not. And that's going to be a problem, especially for the Mets, who, let's face it, have not had the best luck here. Uh, 2015, he only played, he started 11 games. Uh, 2016, he started 11, pitched in 22. 2017, he started and, pit, and played in uh, 31. 2018, he started and played in uh, 32. 2019, he started and played in only three. Uh, 2020, uh, 2021, he did not start any but pitched in four. 2022, he started and played in 19. And then 2023, he started and in uh, 18 and pitched in 19. Mm. So not exactly... 
the repertoire of what you would want to right. see. Uh, then you had the Baltimore Orioles have agreed on a one-year, $13 million deal with veteran closer Craig Kimbrell. Hmm. Uh, it's it's a definitely a need Baltimore has. Uh, yeah. Their closer, Felix Bautista, is done probably done for the year. Uh, he's going to need Tommy John surgery if, yeah, he, was... if he hasn't gotten it already. Uh, so, obviously, that he went down late last season, and their bullpen stepped up. But, you know, they were kind of hoping he'd be back. But, obviously, with Tommy John, he's going to be out for the year. So, you need to bring in somebody to kind of back up, shore up that bullpen. And uh, Greg Campbell, def- definitely a hand you could bring in. Very solid move for them. Oh, yeah. 35 years old. He had an eight-year stretch with 1.97 ERA. Uh, and then he had a uh, rate of 14.6 strikeouts per nine innings. So, for every nine innings he pitched, he struck out 14 guys. Yeah. Dude, dude's pretty good. You know, so it, it definitely a good move for uh, Baltimore's back end. Hey. Yeah, no, absolutely. They need to – pitching is the one thing from holding him back from making a big yeah. break. Yeah, So Because they've got talent out the wazoo. Oh, yeah. Look look up their, their ratings for when it comes to talent uh, pro, and prospects. Mm-hmm. they got a lot. Uh, and you got Bryce Harper is expressing a desire to stay with the Philadelphia Phillies. He wants to sign an extension after his deal is up. When is his deal up, you might ask? Not this season. Not next season. In 2032. Yeah, he's going to be how old then? Uh, 39 and 20, 2032. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, listen, he <laughs> the deals him and Trout signed because they both signed long-term deals. Uh, Harper signed a 13-year, $330 million contract. Right. When these deals are now coming back to haunt, like, he, sure, he wants to stay there and, and sign a late deal, but I'm sorry, at that stage in his career? Yeah, I mean, 10 years would have made sense because when he signed it, he was 26. Right. 10 years would have made sense. He's 36. He's, you know. Now, they might get some longe- longevity out of this because he was an outfielder when they signed him. Mm-hmm. He's moved to first base. Yeah, he played a decent number of games this past season at first base, and he's even expressed an interest or, a, you know, the possibility of, hey, I'm willing to move to first base full time, which you'll get a lot more uh, distance out of and mileage out of him at first base than you will outfield. Outfield, a lot of legs, a lot of very strenuous on, on the body. First base, yeah, not so much. Yeah. Uh, but ugh, and, and this is the thing, too. He's not going to sign an extension during the contract because he's a Scott Boris uh, client. Scott Boris clients, with the exception of Jose Altuve a couple of years ago, they don't do extensions in contract. Right. I mean, that's the whole thing. I mm-hmm. They might want to lock him up with something, but I just, yeah. I, I just don't see them doing it at, at 40. I yeah. think I – mean, I just don't. I just don't yeah. see it. Let's put that uh, then we got an up. We have an update on the Shohei Otani sweepstakes because it's reaching ludicrous at this point. Uh, Shohei Otani still has not signed with any uh, Major League Baseball team, although according to some rumors and supports and allegedly, uh, it could be coming here in the the next week or a couple of days. Uh, but one of the team, some of the teams we do know that have uh, are interested in his services, the LA Angels, which I would put at like the bottom of the possibility list. Uh, the L.A. Dodgers, Chicago Cubs, San Francisco Giants, and the Toronto Blue Jays. Hmm. God help us if we have to face them fucking however many times they play the Blue Jays each year. Uh, but one of the teams that was uh, interested and uh, might have gotten himself in a little bit of a mess, uh, the Dodgers. Because according to reports, Shohei Otani's camp does not want any indication or any hints of what was talked or discussed, or even if they talked, mentioned to the press. Uh, obviously, the baseball winter meetings are going on right now in Nashville, Tennessee. And, you know, the managers and the GMs and other front office staff are all in Nashville working out deals, working out conversations. Uh, the Rule 5 draft just took place today as we record. Uh, but, you know, so Shohei's camp doesn't want anybody to talk about this. And obviously being in front of basically every baseball writer in America, they're going to ask, like, mm-hmm. hey, did you meet with Shohei? And Dave Roberts was asked, and he kind of paused for a minute, and he's like, well, okay, I don't want to lie to you. Yes, we did. So, listen, it, it is it wrong for him to have said that? No. Like, did he reveal what they said or what they talked about? No. It's like, yeah, we talked to him. So anybody who was in a tizzy because he might have ruined the chances for the Dodgers to get Shohei Otani, calm down. Here's the thing. Otani is a great player. Mm-hmm. But in my opinion, he's going to go to the highest bidder. Oh, yeah. And the Dodgers have bank accounts for days. And he's the one prospect they have a real good shot at getting at because I learned today, Dodgers will not do deals with Scott Boris. Yeah. So if you're a Scott Boris uh, client, 
You're not going to the Dodgers. Uh, Shohei Otani not represented by Scott Boris. Exactly. Yet. So I I fully think he's going there. Probably. And you know it's a better fit. I don't see him going to Toronto. No. I don't think he's I don't think he's leaving the West Coast. No. I mean, and plus the thing you got to remember too is he's likely not going to pitch this year. So he's going to be a hitter all year. Mm-hmm. And I think it makes better sense for him to be with the Dodgers. The Giants is not really a hitter's park. No, it's not. So I, I, I wouldn't see the benefit of going there. I Dodgers, just, slightly more so, although not much. It's slightly, but it's L.A. There's a lot more ways to market yourself and get money on the back end. Yeah. I That's where I think he ultimately goes. I don't think he leaves uh, L.A. Mm-hmm. Just a different team. Then you have the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox making a trade. Yeah, I saw this. This is kind of wild. That's all weird. Uh, so, yeah, the Yankees acquired uh, outfielder Alex Verdugo from the Boston Red Sox on Tuesday night uh, with the Yankees uh, taking the uh, 27-year-old outfielder you know, to help with their offense a little bit. Uh, and then, in turn, Boston received pitchers Richard Fitz, Greg Weissert, and Nicholas Judice. So uh, if you've heard of any of those guys, congratulations. You know more about them than I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, none, none, from what I understand, because I listened to the John Boy guys talk about this last night and today, none of the guys are you know even ranked or were ranked in the uh, Yankees farm system, like in any way, shape, or form. You know, the only one that made some noise was uh, Weissert. Yeah, uh, you know he he pitched a little bit at AAA. The other two guys, uh, Judice and Fitz, uh, you know, hadn't even pitched above the AA level. So, you know, Weiser might not have even made the Yankees bullpen this year if it, that was even a possibility. And then for Fitz and Judice, who the hell knows if these guys are even going to pan out? You know, the, the way I look at it, it's a decent deal for the Yankees because you look at what Verdugo did last year. Uh, he had a two sixty four batting average, 54 RBIs, and uh, 13 home runs in 546 at-bats. You know, so not the greatest numbers, but listen, he's not going to be the starter. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to talk about the one of the starters they're possibly getting, or sounds like they're getting uh, as of recording here in a minute. But you've already got Judge in the outfield. Right. You, you're about to get another guy who we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, he's going to be one of your other outfielders. And then you just need somebody else to plug and play until Jason Dominguez comes back. Because mm-hmm. once Jason Dominguez comes back from, from injury, there's your other outfielder. Right. So you, you'll you need Verdugo, you know, if, if Giancarlo needs a day off, you know, you'll use him as DH. You might bring in Verdugo as a bat or, you know, for a glove late in the game if he, got hit, if he has slightly better defensive numbers or he's got a better matchup or something. Mm-hmm. So is, is he a, you know... Is he the piece that puts the Yankees over the top and, you know, gets them a World Series ring? No, but it's one of the things that I think helps the Yankees because you look at what happened last season when Judge went down. Yeah. And we had all the injuries. And you had, you know, utility infielders starting in the outfield. Hello, Isaiah Kiner Falefa. Mm-hmm. Love the guy. Great, great player. Well, I wouldn't say great. He was a good player. Not an outfielder. He's a utility infielder. The fact that we had a utility infielder starting in outfield, multiple, we had more u- utility infielders starting in the outfield than we had actual outfielders. Really, like, he's he's depth at the outfield, which we desperately need because, let's face it, Judge could get hurt again this year. I'm not hoping it on the guy, but there's that possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and then with the other guys, you, you need that depth at outfield, as we clearly saw last year. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. He's a plug and play. Yeah. So I don't think they gave up too much for him. No, either. no, they they gave up one guy who might have made the maybe may, maybe if he's lucky, and the other two guys who they, who knows if they're even going to pan out. So yeah. you know it's a one he's there for one year, so you know he's in a contract year, so we'll see what happens. Uh, and then the other one that's been going down the last you know, twenty four hours or so that's really heating up is Juan Soto, the San Diego Padres, and the New York Yankees. Mm-hmm. Sounds like all things are said and done. Uh, it sounds like Juan Soto is going to be a New York Yankee and going to be starting outfield. So that's the other outfielder I was alluding to. So it's going to be pretend, probably Juan Soto, Aaron Judge, and then some amalgamation of uh, Trent Grisham, who's apparently, according to John Morosi of MLB Network, uh, and then also being reported by Jack Curry of the Yes Network and Joel Sherman of the, I think he's the New York Daily News. Uh, he's one of the New York papers, mm-hmm. uh, is reporting. He's coming along in, as part of the deal. So he's another outfielder. Uh, you know, so they, they're coming to New York and it's now, and then according to Morosi, Curry and Sherman, the Yankees are sending Michael King, Drew Thorpe, Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez and Kyle Higashioka. So a decent number of pitchers, but let's face it. This is a salary cap dump for the San Diego Padres. Cause in case you didn't know, 
San Diego Padres had a little bit of issue paying bills last year. Uh, they, mm-hmm. had, they, had, they had to take out a loan to help them, uh, you know, make some payments. Uh, so this is them getting under under the uh, a luxury pay, tax. Lux, well, not even a luxury tax. Just getting to a point where they can pay things comfortably and not worry about things. Uh, for the Yankees, a hell of a bat. It's a left-handed bat they desperately need because uh, last couple of years they've been right-handed heavy. So it's a, it's a left-handed bat. Uh, his, so Juan Soto's numbers last year in 568 at-bats, he had 156 hits, 35 home runs, batting average of 275, 109 RBIs, 410 on-base percentage, slugging percentage of uh, 519, and an OPS. So that's on-base percentage and slugging percentage of 930. If he's even close to capable of uh, replicating those numbers in San Diego, which is not a header-friendly park, mm. he's coming to New York where he's going to play 80-some-odd games uh, in Yankee Stadium. Very header-friendly park. They just have to sign him long-term. Well, uh, <laughs> That's the problem. If he's a rental, that's... Well, that's going to be the rough part because he's a, he's a Scott Boris guy. Right. So, which... uh, could he? Maybe. Does he usually sign... Uh, what is it that does he usually sign uh, extensions with his guys? No, but the one exception, Jose Altuve. Yeah, that's what I say. So anything is possible there, yeah. but I think you're investing a lot unless you really think that he is going to get you over the hump. Mm-hmm. He's a great piece to add. Oh, don't, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Defensively, he's great. But what I think we need is him to sign long-term. They need to work the deal out because mm-hmm. I think if he's a rental, this is, yeah. this is, this is a bad move. But – that's only if he's a rental. Well, that, that's the thing, though, is like you've got him now for the if if this goes through because it's not, unless we get a Cliff Lee situation, which that's a whole situation I can't get into in, with enough time. Mm-hmm. You or Google it or YouTube it. Yankees had Cliff Lee at at the finish line and then it fell apart. Yeah. Um. But unless we've got a Cliff Lee situation, it sounds like it's done. So you've got him for a full year with Judge and Cole. And all you know, Rizzo and all the other guys to really sell him on New York and really convince him that like New York is the place to be. Yeah, which to me is a lot easier to do than in two weeks in the off season next year. Oh yeah, absolutely. So and from what I understand, Juan Soto, big sports guy. You know who else is a big sports guy? Aaron Judge could go to a couple of Ranger games together, bond and, and really mesh over a couple of New York Rangers hockey games. So you never know what could happen. Well, I think the possibilities are yeah, high here. Yeah. So. Uh, just for the other guy, uh, Trent Grisham, also an outfielder. So, again, not going to be a starter, you know, uh, for the full season, but he's another guy uh, on the bench that can be outfielder. 216 average last year, 61 home – or, or that, sorry, that's his career. Uh, 198 average, 13 home runs last year in 469 at-bats, 50 RBIs, on-base percentage of 315. So decent numbers, but he doesn't play every day. and He's not going to play every day in New York. Yeah. So, well, you know, we'll see what happens. And then the last bit with the Major League Baseball is obviously the Japanese pitcher Yashinobu Yamamoto. Everybody's in on this. I know the big story today is, oh, oh Steve Cohen went, flew to Japan to meet with him. Spoiler alert, so did Brian Cashman back in March yeah. for the uh, World Baseball Classic. He flew back, he flew to Japan in March, and so did every other GM. Steve Cohen's just the last one to do it. According to reports, Yankees are the heavy favorites to get him, which, according to what I heard today, Yankees have enlisted the help of one Godzilla, Hideki Matsui. Oh, that's big. To uh, curry favor and uh, help help him come to New York, which did did work prior with uh, Masahiro Tanaka. Mm-hmm. Masahiro Tanaka, another Japanese pitcher who came to the Yankees because of Hideki Matsui helping. Personally, I'd send them both of them. Send Tanaka. Tanaka said nothing great, but great things to say about the Yankees. Obviously, Hideki loves New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hopefully we get uh, uh, the Japanese pitcher there because him, he won't be the number one. No, he, he doesn't a, need to be. He, he doesn't need to be. Cole's the number one. He's the reigning Cy Young Award winner. But you got Cole number one. You have him number two. If we get Rodon for a healthy year, that's a pretty decent starting rotation right there with three pitchers, and you can fill out the rest. Yeah, I mean, that's what they need to do. They need a solid number two. If Rodon is going to be the guy, mm-hmm. then sure. But yeah. you know, if not, this guy, is. I think, he has the possibilities yeah. to do it. Then lastly, certainly not leastly for me, we got one college football game going on this weekend. Arguably the most important college football game of the entire year. For the if my if uh, my information is correctly for the 124th time, you have Army taking on Navy this Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern on CBS. If you have Paramount Plus, you should be able to watch the game as well on Paramount Plus uh, from 
Foxborough, Massachusetts, home of the New England Patriots. They'll be taking on uh, the all-time series. Navy currently leads the matchup 62-54 to 54 with seven ties. Largest margin of victory was 51 to nothing in 1973. Ew. The longest win streak was Navy from 2002 to 2015. Uh, Army currently on a one-game winning streak. Uh, some interesting stats about this game because this is one of the most longest-running uh, college football matchups in America mm-hmm. and football matchups in America. Uh, they face, the, uh, let's see, you have the, uh, the cadets and midshipmen played the first Army-Navy football game on November 29th, 1890 in the on the plain at West Point. Navy had been playing organized football since 1879 and wow. defeated the newly established Army team 24 to nothing. The 271 members of the Corps of Cadets each contributed 52 cents to pay half of Navy's traveling costs for the 1890 game. Uh, although today we know the game as an annual tradition, and it has been since such since 1930, there have been 10 times when the Army-Navy game was not played. Uh, it's said the longest interruption, which lasted from 1894 to 1898, came about after an argument between an Army general and a Navy admiral, almost resulting in a duel following the 1893 game. Jeez. You thought there were some fights between the Eagles and the and the 49ers. Mm-hmm. Some dudes almost killed each other. Uh, the game also wasn't played in 1909. That year, Army canceled its remaining games after Cadet Eugene Byrne died from an injury sustained in an October game against Harvard. Twice during World War I, uh, 1917 and 1918, games were canceled on orders from the War Department, and then in 1928 and 1929, the academics could not reconcile player eligibility standards. On November 27th, 1926, the game was held in Chicago for the formal dedication of Soldier Field in honor of American service men who had fought in World War I. Uh, you had going back to 1944 and 1945, Army and Navy were ranked one and two in, uh, respectively. Army won both games. Uh, and then you've got the mascots, which are a huge tradition. Uh, usually each year, one side steals the other's mascot and some sort of uh, shenanigans. I know Army pulled off stealing the Navy's goat a couple years ago. <laughs> yeah. Usually, there, usually there's some uh, shenanigans with that. Did you know the first instance of instant replay during the 1963 Army Navy game? Hmm. Uh, you, it, it's a great game. It's one you should definitely check out. You know, like I said, uh, the awesome thing they do is at the end of the game they sing each other's alma maters. Whoever wins, or excuse me, whoever loses sings first. So that's why you'll hear the, you might hear him yell, "Sing second because you sing second, you won the game. Right. So definitely give it a check. It's one. It's an awesome game. I uh, definitely the guys uh, who play on that field will be going on to serve in the armed services uh, after they graduate, and the and the guys and girls you see on the field because they do the march ons, and it's the entire corps and the mid, it's the into, uh, cadets and it's the mid, all the midshipmen. They're all going off to serve, and it's a fun game to watch. Yeah. It's something that you definitely want to check out if you have the time to. Yeah. It's just it's tradition. It yeah. is something that is taken in such a high manner. Mm-hmm. And like I say, you for what they do and going in the service, like this is a great thing to just rally yeah. around and just give them all the support by watching and, yeah. and checking the game out. Yeah. Uh, for me, very quickly, NBA wise, I know the in season tournament is still in swing. The Knicks lost to the the Bucks. Yikes! But in the standings in the Eastern Conference, we're still looking okay. Uh, they're currently fifth uh, behind Boston, Milwaukee, Orlando, and Philadelphia. Orlando's been the surprise of the season thus far. Indiana, Miami, Cleveland, Brooklyn, and Atlanta round out the top ten. Mm-hmm. On the West Coast side, Minnesota is still hanging in there at number one. Oklahoma City, number two. Denver, the Lakers, who had a little bit of controversy against Phoenix this past week uh, with a certain ending to the game, mm-hmm. uh, made a lot of noise, but they're sitting there at number four. Sacramento's at five. Dallas at six. The aforementioned Phoenix Suns at seven. New Orleans at eight. The Clippers have cracked into the top ten, folks. Hey. Don't know how I feel about that. And Houston rounds out the top ten with Golden State outside looking in. Ooh. Kind of a weird thing to say. Still early. Yeah, it's still very early. So, you know, like I say, we'll start really paying attention at Christmas Day. But the in season tournament is going on, and a lot of uh, fans have been checking out and really excited about it. So, hey, more yeah, power to it. Yeah. But the Knicks are out. So, you know, my my interest is going to kind of die off a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so your interest is dying for like the next three weeks. Yep, basically. And uh, obviously, we're talking hockey. The Rangers still sitting on top of that Metropolitan Division with a record of 18 5 and 1. Mm-hmm. Took a bad loss against uh, Ottawa, though. Good Lord, they got sh- shellacked. Yeah, it was not a good uh, night on the ice, folks. Uh, losing six to two, especially Tarasenko, who I forgot wound up there. Yeah, 
uh, came back to haunt them. Yeah, I had a feeling about that. Yeah, so, you know, we can't win them all. That's why we, we stay very grounded. Still very much uh, in the lead, though, by four games uh, over Carolina. Also in the Eastern Conference, technically first place. Yes, so we'll still take that win and carry it forward. Next game for the Blue Shirts is on December 9th against the Capitals. Yeah. So definitely stay tuned for that. And last but not least, we got to talk some pro wrestling. I mean, what kind of podcast would it be if we didn't? Mm-hmm. So this week is NXT's deadline. Mm-hmm. So their year-ending premium live event, which is going to be taking place from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Very stacked card, so Pat, let's go over it, shall we? Yeah, sure. So uh, the first match that we got to talk about that it looks like it's going to be on the pre-show is going to be uh, a singles matchup between Axiom taking on Nathan Frazier. going to be a fun match, high-flying. Uh, I'm here for it. It's going to get the crowd excited. Yeah. I don't doubt Axiom winning, though. Mm. Just going to put it out there. Uh, I'm going to say the same. Uh, Then you've got the first of the Iron Survivor Challenges, uh, and the winner of this match determines the number one contender for the NXT Championship. Uh, This one is the men's, uh, and your participants are Dijak, Trick Williams, Josh Briggs, Braun Breaker, and Tyler Bate. The Iron Survivor is a weird match. Mm-hmm. It takes a minute to get used to it, but once you kind of get into it, the flow of it, you're like, okay, I get it. Yeah, so like I say, it's kind of whoever amounts the, the most pinfalls in the time period. Mm-hmm. There's people you have to go back to a cage and wait to get out. Yep. It's, it's it's kind of, like I say, it's complicated to kind of describe, but it does make sense when you see it live. Yeah. And obviously, I think you, there's no way you can go against Trick Williams here. Yeah. I, I think it's his to lose. I, I don't see them... Yeah, like I say, as cool as it would be to see Dijak get it, who I think is always worthy of, of getting a title shot like that, or yeah. Josh, or even Josh Briggs. Yeah. I, this is Trick Williams, the most over wrestler right now in NXT. Uh, I pulled up the rules. Uh, so there's a dumb bunch of variations of this, but the NXT version. Uh, so it's five wrestlers compete in the match, which lasts 25 minutes. Two wrestlers start the match, which begins the timer, and every five minutes another wrestler enters with the fifth and final participant entering at the 15-minute mark. Each time a wrestler scores a pinfall, submission, or being the victim of a disqualification, they gain a point. Points can be gained even before other participants have entered. A wrestler who is pinned, submitted, or is disqualified goes into a penalty box for 90 seconds. The winner of the match, dubbed the Iron Survivor, is the wrestler who scores the most points at the end of the 25-minute minute time limit. In the result of a tie, those, two, those who are tied enter sudden death overtime. Uh, and then, obviously, as we mentioned, the winners of the matches, men's and women's, earn a future shot at the NXT Championship and the NXT Women's Championship, uh, respectively. Yeah, so like I say, definitely taking Trick Williams on. Uh, I'm going to say um, Dijak. Okay. I'm going to say Dijak. I'd be okay with that. Uh, I, something tells me he might have gone after and uh, started taking Randy Orton's uh, lifting technique. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's looking big. Yes. Uh, then you've got the Women's Iron Survivor Challenge, where, again, this uh, the winner of this match is the number one contender for the NXT Women's Championship, and your uh, participants are Tiffany Stratton, Lash Legend, Blair Davenport, Kalani Jordan, and Fallon Henley. Ooh, great field for this match. Uh-huh. I would say... <sighs> See, I'm torn. Okay. I don't think it's going to be Tiffany Stratton. I think Tiffany no. Stratton's on the way out. Uh, yeah. She's going to go main roster. Yeah. No, no way to deny that. However, though, Lash Legend now has a viral clip now. Mm. She slammed Otis. Oh, shit. On the last NXT Go wow. Home show. Wow. Yeah. That ain't easy. No, it's not. So, that said, I could see her sliding in and getting the win here. Mm-hmm. However, though, I'm going to just say for argument's sake, the one who I thought was going to do it, because I think that she's on the verge of making a big break, and that's Fallon Henley. Right. Uh, But I would say if Lash gets it, I don't doubt it. Right. Because like I said, especially after seeing the clip with her and Otis, I don't think that, like, she's going to, I think she's going to put on an amazing performance to begin with, but I think now you got a lot more fans knowing who you are mm-hmm. and that could elevate and sway a little bit. So right. I think, I think that's going to be a big win for her. Uh, I'm going to say Lash legend as well. Okay. Uh, then you've got Ilya Dragunov taking on Baron Corbin in a singles matchup for the NXT championship. Well, this is kind of an interesting build. Uh-huh. I, I got to admit, it's a little different. Dragunov though, a hell of a champion. One of the most, uh, 
intense wrestlers we've seen in quite some time. Mm-hmm. Baron Corbin, who's been on the resurgence tour down in NXT and taking mm-hmm. the most of it because he's he's back to the Baron of old. Yeah, he is. Which is not a bad thing. It's also now an, another gold medal winner. Uh, he's obviously a Golden Gloves winner. But uh, over the last week or so, uh, he won a gold medal at the Jiu-Jitsu World League on December 2nd. Wow. So he is now, he, uh, yeah, he competed in the Gi Adult Masters Division, uh, submitting Brandon Gully and Colin Miller to capture the gold medal. Interesting. So he is now a gold medal jiu jitsu winner. Really? You know, I would not have picked yeah. him for that. Neither he, would I. But you know, good for him. Yeah. I still think this is Dragonoff to win, though. Dragonoff, and it's going to be hard hitting. It's going to be brutal. Yeah. It's going to be a tough match to watch because I think they're both going to just lay into each other. Mm-hmm. But I do like Dragonoff here, though. Uh, then you've got, in a singles matchup for the NXT North American Championship, Dirty Dominic Mysterio defending his belt against Dragon Lee. Well, unfortunately, Wes Lee has to step away from the title match. Uh, mm-hmm. He has back surgery. He's going to be out e- eight, to, 8 to 12 months. Yikes. So wishing him nothing but a speedy and healthy recovery. Uh, yeah. And best wishes. And they're now going to slide in Dragon Lee to take on Dominic Mysterio. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest with you, it's tough to... Words I never thought I'd be saying. It's tough to go against Dominic Mysterio. Okay. It really is. Uh, Dragon Lee, though, would be great to win the belt, but I think Dom does more with it. Okay. So I'm going to say Dominic retains. I could see it happening. I would not be surprised if it's Dragon Lee, though, with a little help from a uh, certain father. Could be. Because in storyline, he's hurt and it's like, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's not actually hurt. Well, he made the video introduction for Dragon Lee, too. So right. that is possible. I would love it, though. Yeah is if Dragon Lee was on the verge of winning and Santos Escobar came down and hit him mm. and took him out. Just reasons. Uh, then you've got in a steel cage match, Roxanne Perez taking on Kiana James. This is going to be wild. Oh, this is going to be nuts. I love this feud. I think they're going a lot of different places with it. Roxanne Perez is a star down in NXT. Kiana yeah. James is really risen uh, in the that division. I think they're going to put on a hell of performance. I'm going to take Roxanne Perez. But if Kiana somehow pulls out the win, I'm not going to be surprised or, or shocked at. But I'm going to say Roxanne wins. Well, I'm going to say Roxanne as well. Uh, and then lastly, and certainly not leastly, in a singles matchup, you've got Carmelo Hayes taking on Lexus King. Arguably the biggest storyline going on in NXT right now is who is behind the attack on Trick Williams. Carmelo Hayes has been a rumored suspect, but with video footage showing up, Lexus King, a.k.a. Brian Pillman Jr., has been a figure of interest. So now this is going to go to... Uh, a match. I will say this. I think Carmelo is going to win, mm-hmm. but I think that's where the video footage of who actually attacked Trick shows up. Probably. And that's where I think we get now get Carmelo versus Trick at a future show. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going with that too. That, that to me seems like the logical stopping point. Yeah. It'll be a fun night. No, though, nevertheless, uh, going on this Saturday night on the Peacock Network. So definitely make sure you tune in for that. And if you're looking for more pro wrestling action, make sure to follow, subscribe, and watch Nerd Initiative's Wrestling Night Live every Thursday night, Eastern Standard Time, on Nerd Initiative YouTube and social networks, where Rich and myself will be talking about the latest and greatest in pro wrestling. We'll definitely have a little more deep dive about this as we move forward, because there's a lot of storylines that are going to be built out of NXT, and the road to the Royal Rumble is in full effect. Wrestle Kingdom, so much more is going on. So you definitely want to make sure you hit that subscribe button, and don't miss a minute of the content. That said, for anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for this week. So for the one only Padawan J, fuck the Astros, but more importantly, go Army, beat Navy. Let's go. I'm your host, Ken. Thank you as always for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time. Gotta beat down to the punch. Gotta beat down to the punch. Cause they can't bring